already kind of present. Right. So, um, all right. So what are we not going to do today? We're going to cover some very kind of important topics or kind of key issues that you would you should have in mind throughout this process and after this process with OSNs. Um, with, if you start other projects or if you want to improve or anyways. So uh, we're going to cover the issues of the readme files. Um, you might be familiar with them. If you, you're not, you're going to be today. And um, the issue of contributing to your project or to any project and uh, specifically how to make, make it easy for your project to, to get contributions from other people. The very uh, kind of dry issue of licenses. <laughs> and I say dry because it's, um, it's something that we, uh, some, of, some of us wish we do, don't, didn't have to think about, but we have to. So <laughs> we're gonna have, we're gonna have how, um, uh, talking about that, about the readme and contributing, we're gonna have Eric. Eric is a new, I don't know if Eric, you're here already. Yes, you are. So uh, he's new to this community. So we're gonna, we're sending you a, a welcoming hug. And, <clears throat> and then how he's gonna be talking about license. And then we're gonna have Andrea talking about the, this is less less dry, I think, but uh, the very sometimes controversial code of conduct. So, um, and that's going to be today, all right. Uh, in the in the part in line thirty seven, uh, we had a list of things that hopefully uh, you had you have done already, uh, which is to create a vision statement for your project um, to post. Uh, post that as an issue in your GitHub and read the vision projects. Uh, I mean, uh, have the uh, vision uh, ready so you can read it in these breakout rooms to other people and get their feedback. And, and yeah, some mentions of uh, tools you can use to do this, to collaborate with others, right, in your vision. If you haven't done that, please do not worry. Um, if you haven't done anything at all about uh, <laughs> of the assignments. Uh, we don't want you to uh, worry and be um, stressed out about that. Um, anyways, that's important. Okay, so uh, the roll call is in line 48. You're already completing it because awesome, you're great. Um, uh, name, project, and social handles, if you have any or you wanna share, GitHub, Twitter, Mastodon, anything. Um, <clears throat> and in line 30, uh, no, 63, sorry, uh, there's an icebreaker question, uh, which is, is, yeah, it, it's not an easy one. It's like, how have you felt and how do you feel so far um, in this uh, OLS cohort? Uh, but it is an icebreaker in the sense that you can share a link or a GIF or a photo that or a word that expresses how you feel so far and um, i'm gonna i'm gonna add one yeah because you know oh sorry i just messed up. i feel rested because camille joined the team uh, a few months ago and she has been such a, an amazing help for all of us yeah um, but i would say a lot for me so i can focus on the impact research which is my other side of the the job or the other part of my job um i'm not going to tell you more about it but um, yeah, so I feel rested. I'll explain later why in the in the icebreaker question section. Um, so I'm gonna give everyone just one minute to add your names. I think all of you are already, almost all of you are in the roll call. Um, while you do that, I'm gonna do something that is done in every cohort call, which is, Reminding you of the code of conduct and talking about code of conduct. So we're going to talk about that uh, in the uh, final um, presentation with Andrea. Uh, but we have one, and you can access it in the link that is in line eighty nine of the pad, and 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 also remind you that if you experience during this call uh, any unacceptable behavior, according to you, um, or or if you have any concerns or um, anything that you want to share with us, 
uh, you can share with the organizers, with all of us, um, write into team at openlifesize.org or to any single one of us, uh, Berenice, me, Malvika, Amy, yo, anyone. Um, the emails are in line 91, but you already have them, I think. Um, you can uh, follow the transcript. Again, if you have bad sound, if you don't hear very well any reason, you can follow the order transcript uh, by clicking in the live on order AI on, on the top right of your screen or going to the link that is in line 92. Um, we already asked you to edit your name in Zoom to add the W and the, if you are gonna go to the written breakout rooms or the S for the spoken uh, discussions. And um, all right. And Meli is gonna ask you to add yet something else in the pad. So you start getting used to completing the pad because it's important. Meli in line um, yeah. 100. 100, <laughs> yeah. I am already assigning people to the breakout rooms here, just so it, it's ready. Um, yeah, so is there anyone here that hasn't joined in the past couple calls? If so, if you could raise your hand or write it in the chat. Uh, we would like to know who you are, your name, where you are right now, and what is your project. And the same icebreaker we had before, what's your most recent hobby? I see maybe Daniel, you have a little club in hand. Yeah, hi. Um, wasn't able to join uh, previous calls, but um, hi, I'm Dan. Um, currently based in the UK, and I'm with the Radical Inclusion at the Academic Events Project. Awesome. Welcome. Uh, you can watch the recordings. I uh, has mentioned that at least one of them is already up in OLS's YouTube channel, right? So. Um, I have a, a question here through, uh, if it's okay to be in the same breakout room as someone in your project pass, do you think that's fine or it would uh, be better often, to make Often we try not to, um, uh, just so you can get to know the people in the, in the community. If there isn't a specific reason why you, sorry, that was a dog. Uh, if there is a specific reason why you do want to be in the same breakout room, just to discuss with others in a specific issue, whatever, let us know uh, in the messages, um, in the chat, sorry, and, and we'll do it. But ideally, yeah, we want to mix people that are not in the same uh, team. Awesome. Okay. So we'll try to mix people up here. I also see in the chat Sara saying hi, saying that she's from Chile and Carolina. También. <laughs> so welcome, Chilens. Uh, we have we're we're kind of building a group of of Chileans here. Probably they will vote for Pedro Pascal and, and the cohort name. I don't know. <laughs> I'm joking. Um, yeah, I, I, that's uh, also a reminder for those who weren't here in the beginning of the of the call. We have still the the poll uh, open to choose the the cohort name. So uh, many options are available there. Oh, there you go. Carolina is actually Colombian, living in Chile. So. We have other Colombians here too. It's so nice to see some Latin American fellows in OLS. Okay, Paz, you wanna move on to the to the breakout room? Yeah. Introduction. The, um, yeah, exactly. The just posted the pad for for three of you that joined recently. I don't know who you are, uh, but we were twenty two and we're twenty five now. So um, we're gonna start with a breakout room. So be prepared for for talking to others. Um, they last 10 minutes and, and we assign three people per room uh, and we would like you to, uh, we're in line uh, 108, by the way, so we would like you to choose one of the two issues or topics or questions that uh, are in line uh, 110 and 111. Um, so think of a time that you were collaborating or working on an open project and it, it was a complete frame wreck, I mean, difficult, annoying, complex, uh, crazy. What happened? What made it that way? Why do you think it was that way? So that's one thing that you could discuss in the breakout room. The second one, 
would be think of a time that you were collaborating or working on a open project and everything seemed perfect. And it says was perfect in the part, but yeah, that's kind of difficult, was perfect, seemed perfect, <laughs> or it was mostly perfect. What happened? What made it so good, okay? So let's start this, um, this call then with this, uh, these breaker rooms. Meli are gonna be assigning you to uh, them. I'm gonna check the chat right now to see if any of you wanna be in the same room with other team members. Um, yeah, Metal Sentes, Ida, and Jesse, do you want to be in the same room or a different one? Right now you're in the same. I don't see both of you. I, I see now. <laughs> okay, so I see a thumbs up. Okay, there you are. Uh, anybody else in the chat? I think we can open the rooms. Perfect. Right? There yes. we go. So see you in a few minutes. 10 minutes, right, Paz? Yes, 10 minutes. Okay. I'm gonna pause the recording. Resume recording. And we're back. Uh, everybody, how did that go? Does anybody want to speak up about what you discussed for a couple minutes? Please just turn your mic on and proceed. See. Pompona with a with an open mic. Do you want to speak? Okay. Oh, I'll just, mm -hmm. uh, I'll just, I just want... Let's go with Ogbon and then Sol. It seems a uh, uh, connection froze for him. Yeah, that's true. Okay, let's go with Sol first then. Uh, okay, so I just want to thank uh, the people. So in the uh, room where... there, can you hear? Ooh, we could, but it was, uh, I think, overlapping with Sol. Yikes. Let's go with um, Sol first, and then we go back to you, right? Thanks. I just want to uh, thank my peers in the breakout room. I think the name of the project was Science Translate. And um, uh, I was really happy to learn more about other people's projects. It's so inspiring when you learn about something that uh, other people do and you feel you're not alone anymore. And even despite the learning about some difficulties that uh, people might experience, uh, make you help you understand that uh, that. Yeah, you are not alone in trying to build something. And yeah, that's it. Thanks. Yes, that sounds really cool. Yeah, it's it's great to have like some sort of rapport. I see also Sarah in, in the chat commenting that with Zola concluded that if people are willing to learn and unlearn, project, projects flow better. Oh yeah. Hmm? Some likes there. Yeah. Anybody uh, else? Could I add something? Yeah, sure. Uh, so we, we talked about the importance of good leadership, assertive leadership that um, assigns tasks, delegates um, according to people's strength um, without micromanaging people and um, with, you know, making sure that time expectations are realistic and that tasks are articulated very clearly because um, sometimes people can be quite vague and um, indecisive. So there needs to be um, some assertive decision-making going on. Um, and also we talked about the importance of having, so you have a leader, but you also have the importance of a strong second in command because that person, you know, the leader has the, the vision and, you know, assigns the tasks, but the second in command makes sure that it gets done. Um, and I think that's, that partnership is is very important, whether it's a, a three-way partnership or a two-way partnership, that's important. Yeah, especially so early in the project, right, when things aren't that clear yet, 
Yeah, there is a little bit of a chat going on in the chat, <laughs> a little conversation. It's great. Nick, Nikki says it's great when people feel safe to say, I don't know. And how plus one define goals clearly, but let everyone decide on the path to get there. Yeah. I will have to move on to the next section, right? Uh, but please keep chatting because this is super cool. Uh, I asked Doc Bonner to go to, to the chat to continue, but if you want to, if you are hearing us and you want to speak for 30 seconds, I think that would be okay. Too. Yes, now I can hear you. That's cool. So move on. Okay, I couldn't hear him really well. Okay, uh, he, he's gonna go to the rhythm uh, chat then. Uh, okay, so we're gonna talk now about the four things we mentioned at the top of the call that are four standard files that you might see often if you go browsing GitHub projects, uh, the repositories for certain open source projects you might see that they contain always these same kinds of files called license, readme, contributing, and code of conduct. Code of conduct, not code of conduct. We'll go over those files now uh, with some of our guests here, our speakers, and we're gonna talk about the best, best practices to put them together. You don't necessarily have to have all of them in this exact structure in your project, but let's explore a bit and see what is better for your situation. Pass? Yep, and exactly that. And then I'm just gonna introduce our next speaker and also welcome him because he's he's new to OLS, uh, hasn't been uh, with us before. His name is Gary Eric uh, Gatirua. I don't know if I'm pronouncing it well, you correct me, please. And um, so he's gonna talk about uh, readme and contributing. Uh, the slides uh, to uh, his presentation are in line 157. And uh, okay, so let me know if you can, Eric, you can share the screen uh, or you want me to share myself at the screen and then show your slides. Um, uh, I think I'll try to share my screen. Thank you. Perfect. Okay. Um, uh, my screen is visible. Yes. Oh, my slides, sorry. Okay. Thank you. Uh, let me know when I can start. Maybe make them bigger, like um, like uh, the full screen. Okay. A second. Yes, no worries. Perfect. Okay. All good. Great. So, um, can I start? Go ahead. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. Um, my name is Eric Gabiro Kariki. I am from Kenya, and I am a member of the Bioinformatics Hub of Kenya. And uh, I am uh, really excited to be talking about uh, readme and contributing for open projects for GitHub. And uh, let's get on with it. So I'll start with the README on GitHub. So, but then before we talk about the README, the story begins with um, creating a repository and a new repository or a repo is a one-stop location where we store all our file project, our project files. So this is how you create a new repository. So underneath uh, where it says repository name here, you enter a name for your repository and it can be basically anything you want but the shorter the better if you want a repository name with multiple words you can either run all the words together or use hyphens or underscores to separate the words however if you use spaces github will automatically put hyphens in between the words and we discuss this uh, shortly so make sure that uh, the public button is selected and make sure to tick the box that uh, is next here saying initialize this repository with a readme. And we are also going to discuss that shortly. And when you have all that done, then click create repository button. So uh, as I mentioned before, um, there are common naming conventions that are used in GitHub. 
And uh, some of the common ways to label your repository uh, as follows. So we have the snake case where the words are separated by an underscore. We have the camel case where subsequent words after the first word start with an uppercase letter like this one. And then we have the train case where the words are separated by a hyphen and the Pascal case where words start in uppercase letters, but then are separated by an underscore. The golden rule is that the words are not separated by spaces and it's advisable to pick one case convention and follow it to avoid confusion. I'm going to talk about Markdown and uh, Markdown is a simple way to format text uh, and it allows us to add formatting elements to plain text uh, documents, especially on GitHub. So uh, we can look at a few examples of the capabilities of Markdown. Markdown can be able to italicize um, your, um, your content, hold in your content, add headings of different levels, also include embed links and images. Uh, to learn more about this, you can use uh, these resources that I have shared with the site and you can learn more about um, that. So now let's get back to our new repository. So once um, you click the create repository button that we clicked before, you should be able to see a page that's similar to this one. And uh, so let's talk about what we see here. Uh, starting from the top down, uh, this is the path to our current repository. And now we have several tabs here. And the current tab where we are at is the code uh, tab. And this tab shows you the folders and files that are present in your repository. Right now, we only have one file. And that file is readme.md. And MD stands for Markdown, uh, the one that I've just explained. So below your file list, you're going to see your readme file displayed. And it does not say anything at the moment, except the title of your repository. So the readme uh, is defined as the first user guide or the manual of your repository. And it is the default, that, uh, the default file that will be displayed when anyone visits your repository. So the readme here looks pretty boring, so we are going to edit it using this pen icon here. So when you click here, you can be able to edit the name of the um, uh, of the uh, readme, and this is how to. So once you click that uh, pen icon, this is what you're going to see. And uh, in in GitHub, having a change is called committing. And um, so at the down uh, at the bottom of the readme document, you'll see where it says commit changes. And here, um, uh, before you commit, you can write a very short phrase explaining what you did. Um, and this is indicated by this first arrow. And uh, below this first arrow, we can see that you can also have an, a more um, descriptive description, rather. Um, and why it is better is because um, GitHub being a version control platform, it saves every change that you make. And therefore, you might not want to use the name that is proposed here. You can use a better name so that you can keep the versions of the previous documents. Therefore, uh, uh, once you click commit, uh, the, you have completed um, your first readme. And now you can also see the markdown syntax as it will be viewed by other people visiting your repository. So in this case here, we have uh, one hash to so the level one heading, and this one is level two headings, and this would be a level three heading. So how do we contribute uh, on GitHub? First, I'll start by uh, passing some GitHub jargon, uh, which I'm going to use in the next phase of this um, presentation. And one is forking uh, or a fork. A fork is a duplicate of a repository on GitHub that can be synchronized by contributions. And a contributor is a person who has uh, previously made commits to a repository, either by forking or cloning. We have a collaborator. And the collaborator is different from a contributor in that they have commit permissions to the project or the repository. And then we have issues. And an issue is a way to manage or assign tasks. So we'll start with forking and cloning on GitHub. So assuming we'd like to use the content on someone's repository for our own use, or to contribute or to propose some changes to the repository, we first fork their repository. And as mentioned in the previous uh, slide, um, yeah, by forking, you make a, a copy of um, uh, someone's repository. And besides forking, they cloning. So um, this is often done uh, on the command line. And when you clone, you're copying the version control files to your computer. It is important to note that 
any changes you make uh, in either uh, in either case that is forking or cloning do not affect the original files in either case. This is why it makes GitHub a collaborative platform. And uh, now we will talk about issues and what are they. So we would define issues as to do in a project. And this would be the tasks that you need to perform, the bugs that you need to fix, or things that you might want to accomplish. We can label issues, um, label issues and assign them to collaborators, as we can see uh, in this short video that I had compiled here. So when you click on the uh, issues uh, tab, this is what you're going to see. And now you have to uh, add a title to the issue that you're creating. So here is one. After that, you can add a comment, a descriptive comment. I had a uh, pre-made one here. So I can assign this task to someone. In this case, I'm assigning it to me. And I can label this task either as a bug, as a documentation, a duplicate, or an enhancement, etc. In this case, I labeled it as a bug. And then I click the green button to submit these new issues. And voila. So this is the new issue that appears as a bug. And once you click back to the issues tab, this is what you're going to see. And it's assigned as a bug and uh, it's given to me here. Okay. So you have an issue. So in summary, to create and manage uh, an issue, um, uh, you, you, you can click on this bar here and you are going to follow the instructions as I have shown in the previous video. So how do we collaborate on GitHub? Remember that we said uh, when you're making changes either by forking or cloning, you don't affect the original files in either case. Well, in some cases, there is limited access to a repository where the owner might choose to add collaborators who can directly commit their changes to the repository. And to do that, we add collaborators from the settings tab here. And um, when you click on the settings tab, this is what you're going to see. So also, you can search for a GitHub user uh, uh, using their username on GitHub, and you can add them as a collaborator to your repository. Then we have pull requests. So how do you propose changes to someone else's repository if you're not a collaborator? That means that you don't have the full rights. So we'll use pull requests. And it's a rather polite way of saying, uh, hey, could you please pull these changes and add them to your project or your repository? So these changes can be on a forked repository or a branch of your repository. And how to uh, make pull requests is that you go to the pull request tab is normally the that tab because we started with code, we, are, uh, we went to issues, now we're on pull requests. And then you create a new pull request here. So, um, once you, you, you click this, the that thing that is going to appear, or rather uh, what you're going to see is something close to this. And here you are likely to raise an issue uh, that you addressed earlier, or, or give it a new, um, uh, a new title, or add a small description. And then you can commit your changes either to the main branch or to the designated branch in that repository. And then the owner of the repository is going to merge these changes and include them. So that's a contribution. So let's recap what we have just learned. Uh, one is that uh, you, will, you are going to first create um, a fork uh, of the repository that you'd want to contribute to. Then you're going to create a readme file uh, that is a readme.markdown. And then you're going to click the pen to edit and then you personalize this readme so that it can appear the way that you'd like it to appear. Then you commit the changes that you, as uh, shown here. And then you're going to send a pull request. So um, that is our uh, presentation. And I would like uh, your feedback on, you know, probably uh, how the presentation went and whether you got stuck or whether the content was relevant. Thank you very much. I'd like to acknowledge the um, Open Life Science uh, for giving me this opportunity uh, by Informatics Hub of Kenya and uh, Ms. Laura Ondari and Dr. Khaled Tibet who uh, supported this presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Eric. Fantastic and very much on time. So thank you so much. And um, I have uh, I have one question before we go uh, the others on on the path, but quickly one. Uh, did you always, when you started using GitHub, did you always know that 
the readme file was super important. Did you ever skip reading, uh, writing the readme file or did someone explain that to you or how was your process with the, that piece of uh, information, the readme file? Thank you for that question. Uh, and to be honest, uh, I am one of the culprits who never saw uh, readme is as important. But then um, readme is also contribute. Uh, once I learned the importance of a readme and that it would also contribute to your search optimization if someone wants to look for relevant content and they can visit your GitHub, then I saw how important uh, having a readme actually is. So from then on, I never need to have a readme, um, actually a very descriptive one in any of my repositories. So um, in the beginning, uh, people are more focused on just learning the ins and outs of, of, uh, of GitHub, and then they forget uh, a very key point, and that is um, the readme, because it's the first thing that anyone sees when they visit your repository. So when I learned that, that's when I actually started implementing it. We have another question. Is, is a readme like a table of contents? Well, 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 um, I would not, uh, I don't think it's uh, fully like a table of content because it's descriptive. Um, I, I think uh, by opening several readme files on uh, people's um, projects on GitHub, you're going to discover that they are more descriptive than a table of content. Um, they, they contain um, the usage, for example, if it's a tool, um, that one can use to execute a project, then they give you the instructions, uh, the step-by-step -step instructions, and that is not something that you necessarily see um, in a table of content. But yes, it would also double up as a table of content, though a very detailed table of content. That's super useful. I think that there's another question from Hal. To extend the book metaphor, maybe a readme is more like a forward is the comment actually. Yeah. yeah. Do you agree, Eric? Yeah, um uh, it's it's more like a for yes, it's more like a forward. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, and as, also as a... like a landing page. Yeah, actually it's more like a landing page. It just tells the project and sells the uh, whatever you you're, you're doing um, uh, as as part of the, uh, the the project description. Yeah, totally. I, I was gonna ask. Uh, I was gonna add that as a person that didn't grow up speaking English, I'm I'm Brazilian, so you know, I speak Portuguese <laughs> mainly. It helps a lot to like try to really understand why things have their names. So, for example, pull request. You're requesting to pull something. That means you're yes. pulling your content to to that brief or our branch so you can try to visualize a tree with branches where you start yes. making modifications so yeah i think that, that helps us um, um, i don't know if someone is uh communicating they were that, Deborah? yeah Deborah, we didn't hear at all just some noise if you if you want to write uh in the chat or in the pad that also works uh Oh no, pass. It's fine. Sorry, sorry. It's okay. Uh, uh, Car Carmel adds to that for for people from a social science non STEM background. The book metaphor helps. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Um. Okay. So how are we doing with time? Because I'm so bad at uh, checking. I the think time. we should. Yeah, I think we should move on to to house presentation, right? Uh, right yeah. Now. Perfect. All right, thank you. There are a couple of this questions. Awesome. Um, yeah, Eddie, if you can check the questions in the pad. Okay. Those are in line uh, 164. That would be great. Um, if you have to run, no worries. But if, if you can, uh, that, oh, that would be awesome. All right. Okay. I'll check that out. Next thank presentation. You. <laughs> thank you, yeah. Eric, so much. <laughs> thank you. It was, it was really cool. Uh, yeah, next up is how talking about licensing or licenses that we could uh, pick for a repo. It can be a very tricky subject, right? <laughs> it's confusing even for people who have been doing open source for a long time. So you can please start talking. Thank you for being here. Hey, uh, let me share my screen. All right, is the slide showing up? Yes. Uh, all right. Uh, so thanks, everyone. Um, uh, I wanted to start with a disclaimer that uh, 
licenses are related to uh, legal concepts and the law does vary by different regions. Um, I am not a lawyer. Uh, and so if there are uh, specific issues of great concern, uh, I recommend you uh, seek out legal advice um, uh, wherever you happen to be or wherever uh, the laws happen to apply to your situation. Okay, uh, as a short introduction to myself, uh, I, I'm Hao Yi, my pronouns are he, him. I am the reproducibility librarian uh, at the University of Florida in the United States. Um, and I'm going to start with talking about the intention and purpose of a, a license. Um, and so I think starting from uh, a shared point of, you know, what we, you know, all have in common with um, being involved in open life science and what we want to do, um, we all have projects that we want to be open in a way so that they encourage and empower other people uh, to collaborate uh, within these inclusive communities. Uh, if you have seen this um, open leadership framework uh, with these, this like three by three uh, grid, um, licenses fall within you know, the center square here, uh, which is about how we operate our projects in a way that um, allow us to better share them uh, for other people to use. So um, some misconceptions that I wanted to review really quickly about licenses and legal sharing. Um, first of all, if you are sharing something on the internet, that does not automatically allow other people to use um, your work or to remix your work. If you uh, produce something um, like a book um, or a piece of imagery or software um, and you share that with a license, that doesn't prevent you from continuing to publish that work or sell it um, or do whatever you want with it. Uh, if you are still the like primary copyright holder uh, of the work that you have created. Uh, and then thirdly here, um, if you reuse or remix openly licensed work um, and you don't provide attribution, uh, that can still be legal. Uh, but if you are in an academic setting and you do not cite your sources, that can still be considered to be a violation of academic ethics. Um, and so that can still be a, a plagiarism issue um, if you are trying to publish it uh, in like an academic uh, uh, journal um, or as like an academic book. Um, so uh, uh, it's important to also keep in mind that kind of the legal properties of a license um, are defined in a legal sense, uh, but there are other kinds of rules that we operate in in our communities uh, that may also apply. So uh, I want to start with a, a hypothetical scenario, um, which is suppose I take some data on, um, you know, everyone's favorite emoji, uh, and I create a visualization of it, um, and then I store that image on a public GitHub repository. So there's a public link; everyone can view it. Uh, they can like share it on social media. Um, if I don't apply a license to uh, what I have shared on GitHub then legally, uh, I have not actually given permission for other people to use the data or the data visualization uh, for other purposes. So um, they can see it on GitHub. That doesn't mean that they can download the data and use it in a research paper, uh, that they can build an app around it, that they can combine it with other data, et cetera, unless I give permission for someone to do uh, do that thing with uh, with the data that I have shared. So in that case, as the copyright holder of this work, what are the, some of the things that I can do? Uh, what I can do is if someone asks me, hey, I want to write a book and share your data visualization in it, uh, can you give me permission to do so? If I'm the copyright holder, I can give, I can give permission uh, to someone when they ask me for a specific use case. Or 
another thing I can do is I can also give uh, permission broadly to the public for specific uses uh, of the work. And so that's what we're going to talk about in terms of a license is I don't want to have to, you know, have someone ask me for permission every time they want to use uh, something I've created. I'm going to say, here's, uh, here are the terms that I'm sharing this work. Here are the ways you can use it. Um, and then let other people go ahead and do uh, all kinds of awesome and, and cool things uh, with, with the things that I'm sharing. Okay, so that is kind of the purpose of a license. There are many different licenses that are available. Um, so let's talk a little bit about how you choose a license. So in uh, open life science um, and in many other open communities, some of the things that we care about are giving broad permissions for other people to use and reuse our work in many different ways. Um, so allowing people to use it for any purposes, allowing them to uh, modify the work or create derivatives of the work, allowing them to share the original work or their um, uh, modifications of the work to anyone else. And so, uh, these are all kinds of important qualities uh, that we generally tend to prioritize when selecting a license in uh, open source communities uh, and in open science communities. Uh, but, you know, depending on your situation uh, and the work that you are doing, you may select a different form of license that has different kinds of uh, permissions available. Uh, one of the key qualities uh, that we have in our licenses is called attribution. Um, and what this means is that uh, if we share our work um, with a license that requires attribution, it means that if anyone else is going to use that work um, and publish something on it or share it, then they have to acknowledge the source where they got it from. Um, and so common example of this is the Creative Commons by license. Uh, which requires uh, attribution of the original source. There are other kinds of licenses that don't have to require attribution. Uh, so for example, uh, you may have also seen the Creative Commons Zero license. Uh, that license uh, is essentially designating a work to be put into the public domain um, and kind of saying, I don't want to have any kind of copyright ownership of this. Um, and, and let everyone uh, just use it for whatever they would like. Another important uh, aspect when you're thinking about choosing a license is that there are different licenses that are appropriate for different kinds of uh, works. So uh, data and code and creative works such as writing or images, um, all have different ways in which they might be used or reused by other people. And so different licenses um, will be uh, will, might will be necessary uh, for different components uh, of, of a project at some points. Um, so you'll see that, um, and I'll, I'll go find some examples to, to share in the Etherpad um, about uh, you know, projects on GitHub where there is one license to that applies to the whole project. And then also examples of projects where uh, they're they are using multiple licenses in the same project um, and saying, you know, one particular license is for the data and maybe one particular license is for the code and maybe another particular license is for like the documentation. And so uh, you do want to keep that in mind, depending on kind of the kinds of things you are sharing. Okay, how do you implement a license? So Eric gave a great tutorial about uh, using creating readmes and, and, and using readmes in your uh, GitHub repositories. Uh, you can do the same thing um, for creating licenses and adding licenses to your GitHub projects. Um, one thing you may have noticed when you create a new repository is that uh, there are some checkboxes uh, when you create a new repository where you can initialize a readme file and where you can choose a license. Um, and so there are several different licenses that are already built into GitHub, where if you select it, when you create the repository, GitHub will add that license file to you automatically in the repository um, as a license.md file. 
So that is what you can do whenever you are creating a new repository. If you already have uh, an existing repository, another way uh, that you can do this in GitHub is if you add a new text file and you start typing in the file name uh, as license, um, GitHub will actually create a button where you can choose a license template um, at the side uh, where you are creating the file name. Um, so you can see this from this uh, animation here. As soon as that file name is typed out, that, that button will show up and you can choose one of the, to the templates that are built into GitHub. If you are using a license that is not built into GitHub, um, you can add that as a, a license.md file um, in the, the main folder of your GitHub repository. Okay, so uh, to kind of summarize uh, kind of what I talked about so far, and I have some uh, you know, uh, additional detailed, details and additional slides later on uh, if there are questions. Um, but to summarize, you need a license to really give permissions for other people to build off of the work that you are sharing. Um, and you, this is done through a top level file that's named license uh, to make sure that you use a different and appropriate license for code and data and creative content. And then uh, for some good general recommendations um, on um, default licenses uh, that give broad permissions, uh, some recommendations we have are if you are sharing code to use the MIT license, if you are sharing writing or documentation or images to use the Creative Commons by license, uh, and if you are sharing data uh, that you can uh, just share publicly, uh, the Creative Commons zero license uh, is good for data. Okay, uh, so we have some additional resources here. Uh, thanks very much, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Hal. Now I see someone uh, in the in the pad mentioning some controversy about GitHub Copilot, and the person asks. Uh, how licenses extend to other non-code contributions made to GitHub repos? What is the default for non-code contributions? That is a good question. I am I am not sure about that actually. Um, I think the yeah, question might be asking about um, non-code contributions, like if you are writing documentation in like an issue or like a pull request. You know what license that would be applied there. And that is something I'm definitely not clear about. Um, for, for projects that have like both code and non-code, um, again, that's where uh, you ideally want to see a license that um, separates out and applies an appropriate license for the code parts and, a, and an appropriate license for the non-code parts. Yeah. There you go. Uh, what about like images? Would that be like a similar case? If you're yeah, you similar to case. add an image to your repo and it's not owned by you, but you know. Uh, yeah, for for images, if you're sharing an image in your um, in your GitHub repository, uh, again, um, some um, appropriate license for a creative work. Um, so, for example, Creative Commons by license or any other like similar Creative Commons licenses uh, would all be good. Um, it, yeah, those are kind of the general recommendations. Yeah, do we have more questions? Uh, we're going to post that one to Slack too, says Paz. Um, I would like to, to point out also that how has these nice recommendations here for you know, if you want to read more on the topic. Also, Eric shared some links on his presentation too that is now available. Uh, it was uh, like the access was closed, but we have opened it. So if we don't have more questions, we should move on to Andrea's presentation. But I'd like to thank you so much, Hal, because this is- Thank you so uh, much. Yeah. An intricate topic. Yeah, this is yeah. difficult. We, we should be going back to these resources often because uh, it's, you know, it also, it always takes some time to think about what licenses is more adequate. Um, we have a comment here in the chat. 
legally and ethics don't seem to move together. What would be the motivation for licensing of creative works legally, legality or ethics? And then I don't know if you have a comment on that. How? Um, I, you know, this, um, it is a tricky question. Um, and I, I definitely think, you know, that legality and ethics are not always aligned in ways that uh, match your personal values. Um, you know, my, my recommendation is to uh, choose the legal option that uh, you are most comfortable with ethically. Um, and um, sometimes that can mean um, being more restrictive with your license if you are worried about uh, harmful uses of the project you are creating. So if it's sensitive data or if it's data that uh, might be used um, for some kind of harmful purpose, then you know certainly you could share it with an open license, but maybe you have uh, other kinds of restrictions you want to apply in your license. Um, and we definitely are seeing that there are some uh, innovations around creating licenses that specify, you know, you cannot use this uh, work for uh, like military purposes um, or for other kinds of things. Um, it's not always clear how those would be enforced, but um, that definitely is like, you know, setting a, a, a boundary of saying, here's what my expectation is. If you want to use this project, you can't use it for, you know, non-ethical things as described in the license. Thank you. Thank you, Hal. Yeah. Um, yeah, difficult topic too. Uh, I guess we're gonna move on to Andrea's presentation then. We're happy to have you here again with OLS folks. Andrea is also an OLS and SSI fellow, so she is part of the group already in, in that sense too. Uh, she's going to be talking about cons of conduct, as Plaza announced before, and you can start. Share your screen. Okay, thank you. you. Have yes, thank you. Thank you for having me here. I hope this is already uh, the presentation. Just let me know if you see it. Um, yeah. Yep. It okay. Yep. Okay, okay. So I will, I, I will be talking about codes of conduct uh, in open projects. A little bit about the how to create the file that goes into the structure of the of the of the of the, of the project, uh, but also more general how how what what codes of conduct are and why do we use them and and uh, it's a long topic and I will just mark that I only have. 10 minutes, <laughs> but but I am happy to discuss this further in other spaces because this is a topic that sometimes will come back in the future in while you are creating the community. Uh, this is not only the file, this is not only creating it, it's also discussing the values of the community, how you want people to participate, and you may have doubts and everybody has, so so feel free to, 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 to continue this discussion. Um, um, later. So I, I am Andrea Sanchez Tapia. I am a biologist. I am Colombian, but I lived uh, for a long time in Brazil. Now I am based in the US and I, I come from um, the R community and I was part of the, the organization team of USAR 2021 as diversity, accessibility and inclusion lead. And this is the, the way I got introduced to codes of conduct. I am also a member of the code of conduct team at the Carpentries. And uh, as Melly said, I am an open life sci and member of the Turing Way, but this is mostly what has happened with codes of conduct in my case. So I am going to discuss very quickly what a code of conduct is, how it helps creating a positive culture of contribution and collaboration in your communities, in your projects, and how it's structured. So the practical part, I am going to talk about it also. Um, a code of conduct is basically a set of rules. You may have seen them in projects, in repositories, in spaces, even the, in this call, for example. It does not need to be a tangible uh, structure. We have a call and it has a code of conduct and, and there are guidelines. So it's a set of rules to, to, to tell us about the social norms in the space that we are dealing with. And it, they also talk about the responsibilities, the expected behavior and the unacceptable behavior of an organization, a project, a community. 
um, the first question would be like, do you really need a code of conduct? And the code of conduct before it, uh, before you even have to enforce it, it invites the people uh, to your project. It, it talks about you, it talks about the values of your community. And um, it, some people will read the code of conduct and will not be attracted to participate in your community because some, some, some reason, like if, if you cannot have uh, some kind of interactions, they may say it's not good. So it protects the community from the start. It invites people that you want to attract to your project and to your community. And it sets clear expectations uh, on your community members. This is something that happens a lot uh, from uh, open source communities and open, and it's not very common to have uh, codes of conduct in academic spaces. So sometimes we are dealing spaces where there are not an explicit uh, clear set of expectations, but lots of social norms are not explicit. So this is a this is a, a different way to work. It, it makes explicit what you are wanting from the community members. And it tells the contributors or the potential contributors that you care about the community that you are building. And and last of all, last of that, it guides your actions in case something happens, because Unfortunately, sometimes you have uh, undesired interactions or you have members that have interactions that are there to disrupt. So this is not exactly the, the happy part of codes of conduct, of course, but uh, you will have a guide to do something if something happens. And you will understand if, if somebody happens and you are not clear if it's a breach or not, you will have a preparation to this, to, to, to this action. So yes, you need a code of conduct. And um, parts of the, the, of the questions is how and when, then how, how do I set it up and when do I set it up if you're building a project that has a nascent community. I came here with a couple of examples. This is uh, User 2021 is an event and User Knowledge is a project. Um, and the Carpentries is a large community around the world. They have instructors, they have people in Slacks. So not necessarily, it's the size of the project that you have in your hands. These are larger projects, but they all have co uh, codes of conduct. And at some point they decided to implement one. Um, and you can adapt those. The contributor covenant, the third example, is one of the most uh, used uh, templates and standards for, for codes of conduct. It's used by more than 40,000 projects, if I am not mistaken. So, and it's one of the templates that GitHub will give you when you build a code of conduct for your project. When you see these examples, you will see a common structure for all of them. You will see a pledge, a commitment, a diversity statement, something that talks about the vision and the values of your community. You will see also uh, in some of them, the spaces where the COC applies. So not only the GitHub repository, but maybe Slack, Zoom calls, social media interactions, in presential in-person events. So the spaces is also, because you cannot solve, uh, because you cannot solve structural uh, problems around the world. And we all want, would like to have this, but you, you have to know what is the spaces where you indeed can have where you're responsible for the community uh, and what, what, where it's your turn to be responsible for these interactions. You will see some examples of welcome, encourage behavior, what you want people to do in the community. So it, it's not only about the bad part of the, of the behavior, but also what do you want to see? Um, you will see some examples of unwelcome and unacceptable behavior. This can be from very minor uh, behaviors to very bad and like in, in, like definitely unacceptable behaviors, um, such as harassment, such as uh, more things. Let me see. I... Okay, uh, you will see in a correctly built uh, code of conduct a clear way to report uh, the names of the people who compose the enforcement team and the methods of contact. So it, it's going to be an email, it's going to be maybe a form, a Google form, anonymous, hopefully. And hopefully it's not an email where everybody, like the whole company, the whole community sees the email. Somebody 
uh, who is claiming a, a, a report needs to be safe to 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 have a report to to do to file a report so it it cannot be uh, an email that everybody can read because they're going to be discussing potentially uh, sensitive topics um, but you will see how to report who will read because also uh, what happened at the beginning of this call um, Paz remembered the code of conduct and she said the names of the people who can be uh, contacted but also these these people could be the ones who are being reported so you have to have an alternative way of contacting these people and 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 uh, so that you know that you are definitely safe when you do this kind of um, report and attributions where most of us most most projects adapt codes of conduct for the community from the community so so you will have the attributions like from where did you take this this um, code of conduct so i i in, in terminal of in practical terms you the first step would be uh, definitely to adapt an existing coc writing one from scratch is hard it's not necessary people who have written the templates have done a great deal of work so i would say that the, the first step is to adapt the existing coc there are some great uh, great examples out there you can resonate your community can be more in tune with some of the text in one of the communities and you attribute that it there's no problem you're more than welcome to adapt previous text and then you use the structure as a guide to think about your community, to brainstorm what the community is, what if those stru this structure that I mentioned you applies to your community. So if you don't have in-person events, you can remove the part where there, there it's, it's, it says something about in-person events. You are definitely free to adapt it to your project and your, and your uh, case. So you will have to uh, think about what do you want to encourage and discourage, uh, about the spaces that your own project applies um, where um, and to think about this process and to think about the consequences for acting outside the norms so you will have you will see lots of examples some 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 communities ha are very hard so uh, when they are large communities some behaviors are are some communities have um a very tough uh, like like a very strict way to enforce but not necessarily this applies to your community this is definitely i would encourage to think uh, about what is the case that you have and of course make sure that the coc that you did is posted visibly and clearly and it's linked in the readme and that everybody knows that your community your project has one this is not just to check a box this uh writing it and posting it are is only the first step is is I, 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 this is part of the discussion of how you want to build a community and uh in following weeks you will have other talks about community building so this is a key part of community building and this is part of understanding and accepting that you're leading the project and some of these spaces it's you who are going to be the responsible we were talking about leadership earlier and this is one of the cases in which if if you don't if 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 the people who are responsible for the spaces don't act the community may may have trouble when your community starts growing and depending on what's your goal you can invite some members to be part of the team you do not need to be alone in this probably when the, the team is small the community is small it's going to be you or somebody very close but uh you can you can invite and make them part of the discussion about the values and and this is this is going to be later and every once in a while, you can check that the whole process is aligned with the community values, how the community has grown, and this kind of, of process. This is emotional labor. This is not exactly as this is very key, but you have to take care of yourself. And depending on how large the community is, it's better to be prepared. And I, I would I would say that preparedness here is self-care. If you know your values, if you know what you want to promote, if you know who your community is, if in other spaces of the community you are you have been promoting uh, a good spirit of the community, you shouldn't be needing to to see the code of conduct as something that like a, in a in a hyper vigilant state, like like being like a cop, like the community needs some surveillance. You shouldn't be uh, needing to, to to have this. This is not an invitation to surveil uh, the community, but to be cool and prepared you know what you want and and but you're also prepared to act 
and it, it, this this is also in the in the in the other communities of the of in the other spaces of the community try to to encourage the interactions that you want to see um i have i am above the time but i brought some resources um and uh this is a book about how to respond to code of conduct reports. The first chapter is a great abstract uh, of how um, what a code of conduct is, and and uh, and it has examples of 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 com communities that needed uh, some enforcement about co codes of conduct. I brought here also some multilingual versions of the contributor of the contributor covenant and. Uh, for example, the USAR conferences uh, have also translated versions because your projects, I am not an English na native speaker, native English speaker. Uh, I am Colombian, I worked in Brazil a lot, and, and sometimes we need this kind of, of text in other languages. So it's perfectly fine that in your README and that in your code, code of conduct, the text is in the language that your community will have so so feel free to use the languages that the community uses and uh, there are some references about uh, how codes of conduct the presence or not of the community of codes of conduct in conferences for example um, can in fact deter uh, bad behavior like harassment and abuse of power these kind of things i will stop here but as eric and uh, and how did I brought some slides to show you how GitHub also helps you to create a code of conduct in your rep. So uh, if you add a file and you type code of conduct, it will show a code of conduct template that you can edit later. It will ask you for a contact method. I would recommend putting the names of the people who are going to read these reports again. Um, and you will have uh, at the end, if you have the file in your repository with your editions, you will have at the end a repository that has a code of conduct and everybody will see that your community has one. So feel free to come back to the slides and, um, and, to, and to tell me if you have any questions. Thank you so much. That was great. And um... I added a question in Slack. Uh, maybe just to mention it, but um, do you know, Andrea, of any controversy about code of conducts that we can read about in blogs or in any sort of media or online um, that could be, you know, be a good way of uh, getting us uh, to think about code of conducts and its importance? If you have any recommendations, or you, not now maybe, but later on, please put it on the Slack. And if any of you, have any any idea? Um, th this is very personal. I, I want to read about more about that, um, but also I think it's useful for all of you. All right. Um, any other questions? Please put it on the Slack, and I'm gonna ask Andrea to to later check it out and then just respond there Absolutely. because we are running running out of time. And Andrea is super you know, responsive, so yeah, that's why. I <laughs> and. Uh, the same for how and the same for Eric. If you have for the questions, you can put it on the Slack and I can ask them to, to answer there. Uh, also on the Slack, we're going to be adding Eric uh, to the Slack as well, so we can be there. Um, no, you didn't take, you were super good on time, Andrea. I think we, we took too much at the beginning, so no worries at all. Um, uh, we had, a according to the pad, we had a breaker room, but uh, we don't have time. We want to finish on time, so I'm going to just do the closing now. Um, we're always short in, in, in uh, options to to engage, yeah. But unfortunately, like yeah, calls are too short and too long as well. Like <laughs> uh, we okay. So let's see. Um, important for for what comes in your uh, in your project and your process. Like create a GitHub repository. Try to do so. Uh, if you have any any questions or if you feel uh, lost, <laughs> go to the Slack, engage with, with us there. Um, even if you just want to feel, uh, you know, that you're not alone in the, in the process. You can also come to the, tomorrow, no, on Friday, to the co-working on Friday and, and do it well there. And if you have questions at, uh, at that, that, during that hour and a half or two hours that we did a co-working, 
you can use us to ask questions. Um, don't be shy, please. Um, we're line two to four. There, there's uh, another assignment which is like to add the link uh, to your uh, repository in your issue, in your uh, in your GitHub. Um, also use the canvas to start writing a, a readme file. Uh, there's a link as well that you can use as reference. Uh, I'm not going to list all this because I'm going to get you DC and overwhelmed. <laughs> Don't feel overwhelmed. Please um, do as much as you can for the, for the sake of the project. But remember that if you're starting a project, this is a start. You're not supposed to end or finish and complete your project in, in absolute terms at the end of the 16 weeks. Um, remember that. Uh, also add an open license and a code of conduct. So, all the things that you saw in here, please try to practice it. This is just to practice. All right. Next week, there is an uh, another GitHub, but this is more detail. Is a we call it a, a skill up calls and um, is for beginners in GitHub. There are a bunch of of those here. Uh, I think uh, I'm still one a beginner, <laughs> so uh, it come to the to the call. Um, so Malvika is gonna is gonna lead that call. And um, uh, tell us about, or tell me if you can, if you have any issue with not being able to meet with your mentor or anything, please ask for assistance from us. Um, there, is a, there are a couple of people here in this call who haven't been added to the Slack channel yet. Um, we're gonna be doing that. If you have any, any of sort of questions about that, like I haven't been added to this or I haven't, been receiving, you know, the CV mailings or anything like that, please uh, ask me, send me an email uh, or someone in the team and, and we'll get back to you. So I think that's it. Uh, also feedback, this, the parts all also have like uh, the feedback session or section at the end and uh, you can add your comments. And I think those are anonymous because your name does not show up in any place. So please feel free to leave us any comments or suggestions or criticism or feedback of any type. Okay. Do I miss something, Nelly? Uh, well, there is a, a, a discussion happening in the chat about the code of conduct, yes, yet. Um, but I think we, we can follow it there for, for a while uh, after the call. And also, Carmel asked about the links to the skill up sessions. Apparently, it's an outdated link. Do you have a new link? Yes, uh, we should have a new link for that one. Um, it should be added to the to the schedule in the in the website. Not everyone checks that, so um, we're going to be posting it on the Slack. If we don't, or if we don't do it, you know, fast enough, please ask. Ask me on a Slack, bother me there. Um, yeah, so that about the skill up session. Thank you, All Carmen. Right. Yeah, um, well, people in the chat are talking about how like expectations for professional behavior or punitivist approaches uh, in, a, in a code of conduct which are super important topics too. Yeah. Uh, I, I'd say that maybe we should continue this thread on Slack because I'm sure yes. it will be very fruitful. Exactly. If uh, Can I, to uh, everyone that has commented here on, on the chat, uh, let me know if you do not want me to put your comment on the Slack on a thread. I'm going to copy paste part of this chat there so we can continue there and not because this disappears, you know, the chat doesn't go anywhere later. Um, if you don't, let Perfect. me know. All right. Okay. Thank you so much, everyone. Great seeing your faces and uh, or your names on the screen. Uh, anonymize. Okay. Anonymize. Uh, uh, I cannot pronounce that word. Anonymize my comment. I will do that. Perfect. Thank you all. Have a great rest of the week. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Ciao, ciao. Thanks for the invite. Ciao, Andrea. Ciao, Eddie. Ciao, how? Thank you.